Lord. How much I need thee every hour, every hour. Savior, keep me every hour. Praise the Lord. We have a visitor in the children's room. I know his selection is 288. <laughs> so we're going to sing 288 for that visitor with a different look. <laughs> but a kid. <laughs> down at the cross. Brother Keith, we're sending you off with down at the cross. Okay, 288, down at the cross. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his, glory to his name. Glory to his, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to, glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his, glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Hill. Work in your heart on the Sabbath. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to another Bible study. We're thankful that you're here, and we're thankful for those who've joined on the conference line and the YouTube from different places. Our topic for today is a very interesting one, also very thought-provoking. It has to do with the doctrine of the incarnation, the doctrine of the incarnation. And this has presented uh, many theological um, ramifications concerning the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the Protestant view, we have the view of the Catholics, Catholicism, and of course, 
I have the view of this church and the many of the churches and independent ministries. So we're going to look at it again and see what we can get from this study this afternoon. This is a very important study because if you don't understand the nature of Christ, the right nature of Christ, then he cannot be your savior. So listen carefully, take notes, and if you have any question you can ask as we go along, but make sure that you speak in a microphone that those who are watching, those who are listening, they will hear what you have to say. So right now we'll bow our heads and have a word of prayer. And the scripture reading that we'll use to begin is first John chapter 1, 1 to 3. First John 1, 1 to 3. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the opportunity we have once again to study the word of truth. As this subject is presented this evening concerning the incarnation of your son, he came in the flesh, give us understanding hearts so we can truly understand his nature through the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of the word. Bless everyone who was tuned in this afternoon and I pray that when we come to the end of part one of this study, everyone will be blessed and there'll be a clear understanding who your son was when he walked to this earth. Thank you for the spirit. Thank you for the word. And we pray now that you'll be with us as we enter into this study. I pray in your son's name. Amen. First John 1, 1 to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that he also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So here we have personal witness. Jesus came. They saw him, they walked with him, they talked with him, they slept in one common area. They saw what he went through, his sayings, his miracles. So we have an eyewitness report that the Son of God was a real person, walked this earth 2,000 years ago in the flesh. He was not a phantom, he was not a ghost. He was a real man who mingled with people in the then known world. And so we have the witness of the different apostles and John, who was very near to him, witness concerning his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. He was the last apostle to die. And after he left, he was released from Patmos, he went to Ephesus and there he died. So let us look at the doctrine of the incarnation. So this doctrine is a great dividing line in theology. It's a great dividing line in theology. It separates those from who preach the truth and teach the truth from those who do not preach and teach the truth concerning the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us look at another passage, 1 John 4, 1 to 3. 1 John 4, 1 to 3. Thank you. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, 
because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof we have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So John says that we can overcome the spirit of the Antichrist. And from his day, the Antichrist appeared. Now, when we talk of the word Antichrist, you know what it means. It's not saying that there is someone who is against Christ because the prefix anti in English means against, but not so in the Greek. So it really means instead of or in place of. So here is a system. We do not believe that the Antichrist is a person. We believe that the Antichrist is a false system of religion that has taken over the earth religiously. It's a false system of religion that has manifested itself from the days of the Apostle John and other apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this has nothing to do with whether Jesus had flesh and bones. But the kind of flesh that Jesus accepted when he came to earth. So we must understand the kind of flesh that Jesus had when he came to earth. And the Bible is very explicit about that, especially the Apostle Paul. And that's what we're going to look into this evening and beyond. Now, the question is, did Jesus have flesh like those he came to save or some other kind of flesh? How far down the ladder of humanity did Jesus come? So the question is, was Christ like one of us? How far did he come down the ladder of humanity? Did he stop part way? Or he came right down to our level and identify himself with us. And so we'll see from this study this afternoon, at least part one of this study, who was the Lord Jesus Christ? Was he like us? John connects the doctrine of the incarnation with the Antichrist. With the Antichrist. And when we say incarnation, it comes from two Greek words, incarnus, which means in flesh. He came in flesh. And as I said before, the term antichrist, antichristu, means instead of or in place of. So there's a religious system on earth that has taken the place of Christ upon earth. It doesn't mean, my friends, that the system is against Christ because it is religious. It has wrapped itself in a religious garb and that is to deceive. Yes. Now, 2 John verse 7, one chapter. 2 John verse 7, it says... In 2 John, verse 7. Second epistle of John, verse 7. Hear the word of the Lord. Second epistle of John, 2 John, verse 7. Second John, verse 7. Thank you. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. 
And when John was on earth, you had special people who called themselves docetists. They believed that Christ was a phantom. He was not real, so they denied that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Now this is a deceiver and an antichrist. An antichrist. So they did not believe that Christ came in the flesh, but he had some phantom-like appearance. So John was dealing with those individuals. How does Catholicism fit into the Antichrist system of religion? How does Catholicism fit into the Antichrist system of religion? Now, the Catholic Church is universal. They do not call themselves Christians, but they call themselves what? Catholics. Catholics. And they believe that anyone who must be saved must go through the Catholic Church. Now, let's see the Word of God. Three prophetic symbols of Catholicism. How many? Three. Three prophetic symbols of Catholicism. You need to write down as I go because, you know, you don't have good memory like myself. <laughs> so get a piece of paper and write down these passages, saints. That you can review them. It's important that you do that. Don't trust your brain. Right? Yes. Don't trust your brain. I was listening to a song coming down on K-Love. And it's a beautiful song. But I did not write down the name of the song. And I said to myself, I will remember it. And by the time I reach it, I don't remember the song. <laughs> so it's important that you write down. <laughs> right? <laughs> So there are three prophetic symbols of Catholicism. Let's see what they are. Number one, the nondescript beast of Daniel 7. The what? Nondescript beast of Daniel 7. We call that beast nondescript because there's no beast in nature that resembles that beast. It cannot be identified in nature. So it's called nondescript. So the little horn, let's see Daniel 7, 23 to 26. Daniel 7, 23 to 26. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse, that means different, from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it, in pieces and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall what? Sit. The judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So this system of religion will continue until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Daniel saw four beasts in Daniel 7. One, a lion with eagle's wings. A man's heart was given to it. Then he saw another beast. A bear came up out of the sea with three ribs in its mouth. The lion, symbolic of Babylon. The bear coming up with three ribs, three kingdoms that the Medes and the Persian uprooted and came up on one side to show that one kingdom was stronger than the other. And then the leopard came up with what? Four heads and it has wings. Wings symbolic of swiftness. 
the kingdom of Alexander the Great. It was divided into four different kingdoms by his four generals after he died. And after that, another beast came up out of the sea. And that beast is called the nondescript beast. It has ten horns. It has iron teeth and the claws like iron. So it's a nondescript beast. So we find that by 476 AD, the Roman kingdom was divided up into 10 different kingdoms. It's called the Iron Kingdom. They became barbaric kingdoms of Europe. But when the prophet looked, he saw a little horn coming up among the what? The 10 horns and that little horn, it has eyes and a mouth speaking great things against the Most High God. So it has intelligence. So eyes symbolic of intelligence. And that little horn uprooted how many horns? Three horns. Three kingdoms are uprooted. Why? Because they did not believe in her theology. They were Aryan kingdoms because they believed that Christ was created. So for the papacy to establish itself, it must root up those three kingdoms. The Vandals, North Africa, the Astrogoths, and the Heruli were uprooted. They disappeared from the face of the earth. They were completely wiped out. And so seven kingdoms were now left. So for the papacy to establish itself, it had to get rid of those Aryan kingdoms. So that little horn, that little horn that came up, it came out of Imperial Rome. It came out of what? Imperial, Imperial Rome or Pagan Rome. Yep. And that little horn came on the scene beginning in 508 AD when Pagan Rome passed on its power to Papal Rome, but the papacy was not established until 30 years after 538 AD. So we find then it had 30 years of gestation, of development. So by 538 AD, there was a union of what? Church and state, which is called the abomination of desolation. So we see Daniel describes that little horn power that came on the scene and it would continue for how long? Until a time and times and dividing of time. Now, you have to use biblical time to really cipher out time, times and dividing of time. So we find that one time is equal to one year. Yes. And in one year, you have 360 days. We're using the lunar time because you can only use lunar time to calculate time prophecy. So a day in prophecy is one year. Ezekiel 4 verse 6. I appointed each day for a year. So 360 days would give you three 60 years and then you have times two times two 360 is 720 and then half a time is half of 360 which is 180 so when you add it all up you get 360 days are prophetic years so this little horn power Ruled from 538 to when? 1798. 1260 years and in 1798 the papacy received a deadly wound. So that's the first symbol, my friends, of the prophetic forecast of Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. That's the first symbol. What's the second? The man of sin. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let's see those two verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Listen to the word of the Lord. And it says, 
Let no man deceive you by what? Enemies. For that day shall not come. Except there come a what? A falling away from what? From the truth. So that falling away from the truth must come first. And that man of sin be what? Revealed the son of perdition. Now, why is he called the son of perdition? The word perdition means destruction. Judas was called the son of perdition because he betrayed whom? He betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. And this system of false religion is called the son of perdition because it betrays the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he is God sitteth in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is what? That he is God. So this is a false system of religion. That we'll have to deal with as we approach the end of time. And the close of human probation. So he'll sit in the temple of God. Now, sitting in the temple of God here, it doesn't mean a literal building. It doesn't mean a literal building. So the writer, Paul, is using symbolic language here. Now, which temple is the temple of God? The mind is a temple of God. I mean, the body is God's temple. So when you believe on truth, what happens? You're introducing what into your body? Error. And you should not defile your body with error, your mind with error. Your mind should only believe what? The truth. So if you defile your mind with error, then you're substituting Christ for another what? Another. Another ruler. Another system of religion that does not bear the truth. So your brain is defiled with error. Therefore you're defiling God's temple with error. So not only with bad foods or unclean foods that you defile God's by the temple. You defile God's by the temple by believing error. Now, what other temple God has? What other temple God has? The temple of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a temple in time. Yes. We call it sanctuary in time. What do we call it? Sanctuary in time. God's Sabbath is his sanctuary in time. In fact, the Sabbath is a cathedral of time. It's a what? Cathedral of time. Anywhere you go in the world, in your time zone, then you can worship on the Sabbath anywhere. You could go to the bank of a river. You can go in the woods. You can go by the side of the lake. You can stay on the ocean. You can stay on a river. You can worship God anywhere on the Sabbath because it is cathedral in time. God dwells in time. So when God made the Sabbath, God entered into time and by entering into time, he sanctified time with his presence. And the same piece of time from creation is cyclical every week. The Sabbath was blessed in three ways. And what are those three ways? The Bible said he what? He sanctified it, he blessed it, and what else? He rested upon it, he hallowed it. So we find that the Sabbath then was sanctified with whose presence? His presence. His presence. So he entered into time. And by God entering into time, the Sabbath is sanctified and set aside for worship. So that same piece of time is coming around every seventh day. Now, look what the man of sin will do, this false system of religion. In the new world order, what will he do? Change. He will Change. paste, he will paste a false day of worship over God's time. 
So by pasting a false day of worship over God's time, he's substituting God's holy time for his day of worship that he has set aside. So by doing that, he's sitting in God's temple saying he's what? He's God. Do you understand? He's God. He's sitting in God's time of worship by pasting a false day of worship over the seventh day, the first day of the week, and say, this is the time you ought to worship. So by doing that, he sets up the abomination of desolation by substituting a false day of worship for God's day of worship. So by that way, he's sitting in God's temple saying that he is God. And the seventh day Sabbath is God's sanctuary in time. It's God's what? Sanctuary in time. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. You have a microphone. You need a microphone. Brother Booth, not too long. Oh, yes. State your point and stop. Okay, really, okay, I'll just do one. You said the cathedral, right? But I don't like the cathedral thing because a cathedral is a building that is established on where bloodshed was done in the past and within a cathedral is graveyards and coffins well so god doesn't really accept worship in that building in so cathedral literal cathedral but this cathedral here is in time it means that it has universal significance okay so well if you don't like it then that's why it says sanctuary in time Thank you. Sanctuary in times. You don't like the word cathedral because of its connotation, right? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. All right, right. Next point. A uh, quick one. Um, the other one is theology, right? Yeah. Um, the Antichrist. Okay, our other theologies is Antichrist. Example, say, like the Krishna movement. Well, they don't have a theology because theology here means with the study of whom? Sorry, it's a right. science of the study of God. The true God. Thank you. Yeah. A point, yes. No, I have to do that because some the Adventists are listening. Yeah. No, no, we got to use the lesser let the light to back up the Bible. They'll come yes. to an understanding of who yes. she is. I will never hide the writing of Ellen G. White from the world because they know who she is already. Yes. Go on YouTube and see how they knock her. Oh. So I have to show that she's authentic. Yes. She's not a force. Yes. And I'll not write, hide her writing from anyone who's listening. Yes. Because her writings are authentic. Yes. And it backs up the word of God. Amen. The man of sin. So that's what it does. Number three. The beast of Revelation 13. Let's turn to that. The beast of Revelation 13. And I stood up on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and what? Ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of. Observe that the beast of Revelation 13 has how many horns? Ten. How many heads? Seven heads and ten horns. So those three horns that were uprooted will be what? Will be replaced. Observe that. Will be replaced. They will be restored. Like America. Okay. And the beast which I saw was like unto a wild leopard. Never change. Right? A leopard will never change its spots. Rome never changes. So Rome has never changed. 
You change for her, but she will not change for you. And his feet were as the feet of a what? A bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So observe my friends, this beast power has all the characteristics of Babylon. The characteristics of the Medes and the Persians. The characteristics of Greece. And the characteristic of pagan Rome. All those characteristics of those power, religious, educational, political, they're all in her. Yes. They're passed along to her. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. The seventh head was wounded. And his dead the wound was what? Was healed. And when the dead the wound was healed, what happened? All the world wandered after the beast. And as I said to you before, we are in the healing of the beast's power. And we are in the sealing of God's children. So both of them, they are going on at the same time. The healing and the sealing. And they worship the dragon which is Satan, which gave power unto the beast. So satanic worship is real in the world. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? No one can make war with her because she controls all the nations of the earth. Right? All the nations of the earth, they're on her side. So no one will make war with her. And there was given to him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue how long? Forty and two months. Forty and two months. So after the deadly wound is healed, the prophet says that this power, the beast, will continue forty and two months or three and a half years, and this is literal time. Let's see verse seven. And it, we skip verse 6. Let's go to verse 6. Sorry. Verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. name. Blaspheme his name. Because he changed his name. And his tabernacle and them that dwell in them. So the true people of God, they dwell in God's sanctuary of time. So because he paced the false day of worship, known as Sunday, over God's time, then what is he doing? He's blaspheming. God's name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell, they will worship on the true day, and also them that dwell in heaven. So his authority goes right up to heaven by what he's doing on earth. Verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with whom? Make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all king dreads and tongues and nations. So this Beast power has what? Universal authority. Its power will control all nations. Because remember now, when Satan offered Christ the kingdoms of this world, he rejected it. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, then my army would fight for it. So who took the kingdoms of the world? Satan gave it to the papacy. And the papacy took it. So let me say, all of us who live in this world, we are owned by Rome. We are the property of Rome. Unless you keep God's holy Sabbath day of rest. 
That's where the line is drawn. And that will be the greatest test in the last day. Yes. So every kingdom, every nation of this world falls under the authority of Rome because Satan has given the kingdoms of this world to that power. So we have three symbols here that identifies Catholicism, Roman Catholicism. The nondescript beast of Daniel 7, the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, and the beast of Revelation chapter 13, 1 to 10. So these three prophetic symbols identify the man of sin or the false system of religion. The term and the Christ is used three times in the epistle of First John. And now let's go to First John 2 verses 18 and 22, chapter 4 verse 3 and so forth. First John. 1 John 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it's the last time. Why Antichrists? This is the plural. Antichrist and Antichrists. Why Antichrists? Yes. But why plural? You see, whenever you believe and teach the doctrines of Rome, you become an Antichrist. So there are many people out there that is preaching and teaching the doctrines of Rome, therefore they become antichrists because they support the antichrist system of religion. Little children, verse, yes, it was verse what? Verse 18, verse 22 now. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So not because people say I believe in Jesus or believe in Yeshua. That makes them my brothers and sisters one who confess the Father and the Son. It is far deeper than that. And we're going to get into that this afternoon. Not everything. But we're going to identify what this means. To believe in the Father and the Son. Or deny the Father and the Son. Let's go to the next passage now. Let's go to 1 John 4 verse 3. 1 John 4 verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Flesh here means, my friends, more than just flesh and bones. You're going to understand what flesh means. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the what? It is in the the world. Let's take 2 John. We read 2 John 7 verse 1. Let's take John 1 John 2 verse 18. We did that? Yes. We did not read. Yeah, okay. So the plural is used form of Antichrist. So John links my friends them together. John, he links them together. John links the doctrine of the incarnation to Antichrist. 
So he links the doctrine of the incarnation to the antichrist system of religion. And it's important that we understand why John did that. The nature of Christ is imperative for us to understand clearly if we are going to face the future and what is to come upon God's true people who keeps the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath. No. The incarnation is the dividing line of theology. It is what? The dividing line of theology. This line of demarcation is very important to understand. Because if you don't understand it, you will be deceived. Yes. It's a dividing line. We are told, He took up on His sinless nature, our sinful nature, that He might know how to succor those that are Tempted, medical ministry, page 181, Ellen G. White. I'm not afraid to confess publicly that Ellen G. White was a true messenger of God. Amen. And the world must know. Now, when the Bible speaks of sinful nature, it doesn't mean, my friends, that he was a sinner. No. I'll explain that later. He took Upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that he might know how to succor those that are what? Tempted. So he can identify himself with what? With us. He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities because he became like us. So when people say that God don't understand what I'm going through, they do not know what they are saying. And that's why he sent his son. Yes. He walked in our moccasins. Yes. So he can understand when we're going through difficulties in this world. Because anything that you suffered in this world, Christ went through them. And suffered far more than the way we are suffering. Far more. The Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception has many people confused. The Immaculate what? So when people talk about the Immaculate Conception, they believe that Jesus Christ was immaculately conceived in Mary. We're going to talk about that too. But let's talk about Catholicism before we go to Protestantism. Many believe that it has to do with the conception of Jesus. But when we talk about the Immaculate Conception, we are not talking about the conception of Jesus. You know, one day I was very young then. I just came into the church. I didn't understand too much about Adventist theology. And I met a Catholic lady and I tried to witness to her. And she said to me, do you believe in the Immaculate Confession, um, Conception? I said, yes, we believe. I said, oh, that's good. But I didn't understand because I believe that the Immaculate Conception had to do with Jesus. But is that Jesus? The Protestant church speaks about the immaculate conception of Jesus. And I'll give the converse between Catholicism and Protestantism when it comes to immaculate conception. Many believe that it has to do with the conception of Jesus. It has to do with the conception of Mary, not Jesus. So Rome teaches that Mary was immaculately conceived in her mother's womb. And that's why God chose her to bring forth Jesus as the Savior. Now, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Good fruit. If Mary was a sinner, 
she could not produce a sinless Jesus. Okay. You see? Yeah. It's a type of syllogism. Mm -hmm. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. If Mary was a sinner, she could not produce a sinless Jesus. So the statement sounds true. Good syllogistic argument. But is it true? No. no. Now let's see if Rome is telling the truth. The Immaculate Conception teaches that Mary was born pure without any trace of what is called original sin. No trace. Mary had an unfallen nature without any bent to sin. She had to be a pure vessel to bring the Son of God into the world. So they teach then that Mary was without sin. Therefore, because she was without sin, then Christ had a sinless nature. Had a sinless nature as a human being. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that. We are not talking about divinity. His divine nature. His human nature. They teach. Because Mary was immaculately conceived. Then her son also was immaculate. And did not have a sinful nature. No, let's move on. Listen. Unlike the rest of the children of Adam, quoting here, the soul of Mary was never subject to sin. Even in the first moment of its infusion in the body, she was, she alone was exempt from the original taint taken from the faith of our fathers, page 171. So Mary, they say, was sinless. And because she was sinless, she could give birth to a son who was also sinless, without sinful human nature. Look at this. The biblical teaching of the incarnation. The Catholic teaching of the incarnation. Now, let's look at this little graphic carefully. On the left is the Catholic doctrine. Jesus did not come down to fall in man, but to Mary. Catholic doctrine. Jesus did not come down to fall in man, but to Mary's level. Why the teacher that came down to Mary's level? Because Mary was what? Immaculate. Without sin. So he came down to Mary's level. Who is above humanity? Mary is above humanity. Now, humanity is what? Sinful. Yes. Has a sinful nature. Yes. But because Mary was immaculate, she didn't have a sinful nature, mm -hmm. then the Savior came down to Mary because he did not have a sinful nature. She only came down to Mary's level. Do you understand? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Not to humanity. So he was above humanity. Mm -hmm. Did not come down to our level. Now, because of her unfallen nature, through the, in, the immaculate conception, on the right, because of her unfallen nature through the conception, we, through the immaculation process, then Jesus came down to her level, not to our level. Mm. Now, on the right, we see the biblical model. Yes. We have the model of Catholicism 
And we have the biblical model. Let's see what the biblical model says. Now. On the biblical model, Jesus reaches all the way down to whom? Fallen to fallen man. On the Catholic model, he did not reach down to fallen man, but he stopped at the level of Mary. Not to fallen humanity. But according to the biblical model, he came straight down to fallen humanity and identified himself with us. Yes. That's what I am saying, that the doctrine of the incarnation is a dividing line in theology. Yes. Do you understand the graphic? He did not come down to fallen humanity, but he came down to Mary in the Catholic model. Yes. In the biblical model, he came down to humanity. He identified himself with us. So there's a gap between God and man and the sinner in Catholicism. Yes. There's a what? A gap between God and and humanity yes. in Catholicism. So God did not deal, came that God did not send his son down to humanity. He stopped at Mary because the man is sinful. Yes. So man will have to go through Mary to approach God. Mm. That's the model of Catholicism. Now, the gap is bridged by Mary. The intercessor between Jesus and the sinner. So Mary becomes a what? Intercessor. So man, fallen man, cannot speak to God directly. He will not hear fallen man. But fallen man have to go to Mary. And then Mary can present the petition of humanity to her son. So Mary become the mediatrix between fallen man and the Lord Jesus Christ. You follow me? She go, becomes a go-between. But that's the teaching of the word of God. No. Let's see Timothy. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. For there is one God, not three, not three, one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's the biblical model, not the model of Catholicism. One mediator. Between God and man. So in heaven today. Christ is at the right hand of the father. Amen. As our mediator. Amen. We don't have to go through Mary. For Jesus to hear us. No. no. He stands between us and the father. Yes. Which mother do you believe? Now, we read the text. In the book, The Glories of Mary, written by St. Alphonsus Liguri, he said in my coat, All graces are dispensed by the hand of that should be Mary, a typo there. Mary alone. And that all those who are saved are saved solely by means of this divine mother. It may be said as a necessary consequence that the salvation of all depend Upon preaching Mary. Upon what? 
Not Jesus. Not Yeshua. Preaching Mary and the confidence in her intercession. Page 8 of the glories of Mary. You see the false doctrine? It is completely out of line with the word of God. I was listening to the Pope praying a few weeks ago. And who do you think that he addressed in his prayer? Mary. Mary. Pray for us. Mary. So Mary is the intercessor. And let me say saints. Those of you here in this building. And those of you listening watching, you must understand the nature of Christ. It's very important that you understand it because this is a dividing line in theology yes. in these last days. Now, that is a very strong statement that I quoted a while ago. Yes. Number one, Mary is a dispenser of what? Grace. Can Mary give you grace? No. Who gives grace? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. She cannot dispense grace. Because she was a sinner. She needed grace. And she died. She died one year after Jesus went back to heaven. She died. Out of a broken heart. Sinners are saved through Mary. Is that true? No. 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 Sinners are not saved through Mary. Sinners are saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeshua. Amen. He's our salvation. Amen. There's no other name no on the heaven given among men whereby we must be Save. saved. Acts 4, verse 12. No other name. No. Not Mary. Mary is another name. Salvation depends on preaching Mary. Is that true? No. We don't preach Mary. Who do we preach? We preach Christ. Because he's the only one who can save us. We preach Christ. For Mary is the sinner's intercessor. Is that true? No. They're all false. Complete contradiction of the plan of salvation. And this is the church that is saying, for you to be saved, you must come through Catholicism. When was the assumption of Mary? Watch the word assumption. Define assumption. Something that is not factual. It's assumed. Right? Yeah. It's assumed. When did she go up? No, listen how they tried to get around this, which is not biblical. Let's see Luke 1, 28 to 31. For there's one God. No, Luke. Sorry for that. Luke. I'm going too fast. Luke 1, 28 to 31. And the angel came in unto her. Who's the her? Mary. Mary. And said, Hail. God is in love with you. You're highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. How would you feel 
If an angel appeared to you, say, Byron, blessed are you among men. You shall bring forth a child. <laughs> Byron, <laughs> that's about to be God's trigenderism. <laughs> huh? So this is a girl who was highly favored. Now, you know what they do? <laughs> they try to adjust her age and say that she was 15 or 16 years old. But she was born B.C. 18. B.C. 18. And they put the death of Herod at B.C. 4, but it's a lie. Herod died B.C. 4, yes. But the Son of God was born before B.C. 4. Because when he was in Egypt with Mary and Joseph, Herod died. So his birth could not be B.C. 4. He was born B.C. 7. So when you check back now from 18 B.C. to the time when Yeshua was born, she was just about 11 or 12 years old. A little girl. And now, scientists have proven that the best time for a woman to have her children is from 12 to 25. But those little girls, you know, they're too young to have children. You see, girls back there, they were far more mature. They had better food to eat. The food was not genetically altered. The oil was, the soil was good, was rich. It had all the nutrients. Today, that's the soil. All the nutrients are depleted. They've got to use chemical fertilizer and all that. So we're not getting all the nutrients and the phytochemicals from our foods. But back there, a young lady, 12 years old, was well developed. My brother. Yes, um. Every generation after Adam becomes weaker and weaker. Their yes. genetics become weaker. So if we look at our father is stronger than us in genetic um, strength, and his father before him is stronger than him. So that's why we can prove that women back then were more wonderful or better. And also there was more oxygen on Earth at that time. The Earth was not polluted. It's not polluted. So. If you go and molest a 12-year-old girl today, you're in trouble. You're in prison. So don't do it. Not even look at them. Don't do it. In some cultures, you have it. It's still practice, a cultural practice, and also religious practice to give a girl from the age of 12. In some cultures, from the age of 7 or 10, into marriage. Yes but not in Western culture. It's dangerous. And when she saw him, who is the him? The angel. The angel. She was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. So she became worried. What is this? What is this? And the angels said unto her, Fear not, Mary for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yehoshua. Jesus is a substitute. Yes. The substitute name. Gabriel said Yehoshua. Rome changed it to Jesus. In the original Greek manuscripts, it's Yehoshua. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him, shall give unto him 
the throne of his father David. That's father here after the lineage of Judah. David is from Judah and he came from the tribe of Judah. So this is speaking of early lineage, not divinity, not divine. Yes, my brother. You mentioned, you mentioned about, um, you, you said, uh, in the, was the, the original text where the name of Christ was Yehoshua? Yeah, Yehoshua, yeah, that's the name. Yes. Would we ever be able to get a copy of that to ownership as like? No, you cannot this? get it. Why not? No. You cannot get a copy of the Greek original manuscript. I think I'm going to head there. Yes, that's where I am. To verse 31. So they use this text to show that Mary is a holy woman. She had no sin. That's why she was highly favored by God. I always thought to say to myself, why did the Lord go to someone who is betrothed or engaged to be married? Why didn't go to a young girl who is a virgin who was not betrothed? But all that is in the prerogative of God. Am I right? Yes. Don't question what God does. Revelation 12. Let's go to Revelation 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Is this heaven where God dwells? No. A woman clothed with the sun. And the moon under her feet. And up on her head a crown of twelve stars. Verse 2. And she being with ch child cried. Travailing in birth. And pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, that mean the angels, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man child, <coughs> excuse me, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God, unto his throne. How Rome interprets this passage? Who is the woman? Mary. They say Mary is the woman. The child was caught up. And her, his mother was also caught up. It's assumption. It's assumed. There's no scriptural proof that that happened. They assumed that. There is no record in the word of God that Mary went to heaven. They assume that. There is no scriptural proof. And this woman could not be Mary. Because Mary did not go into the wilderness for 1260 years with her child. So the prophetic proof and revelation disprove what Rome says about the assumption of Mary. The prophet is speaking about what? The church. The church. The true church. Rome drove the true church into the wilderness, a place of seclusion, where she had to hide to worship God because she would not bow to the dictates of the Roman church. And this went on for 1260 years until the persecution was broken in 1798 when the papers received a deadly wound and the church came out of the wilderness. Amen. Check on the history of Ireland. Yes. Yes, Elder. Elder um, Lewis. I believe that we are living in a time that is the most difficult time to preach this type of Message. Yes, um, is, is the microphone on? Okay, maybe give him some more volume there. Yes, I'm saying that yes. we are living in a time that, is, that appears to be most difficult one for us yes, yes. to preach this type of messages. Yes. We as a Seventh-day Adventist, we know about all of these things. So what about those Catholics out there who have never heard such of things that, that, that warm hate for them 
for many, 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 many hundred of years. Right. So now, how could we do to reach those people with this type of teaching that is so truth and relevant? Because as I said before, I, be, I was a Catholic, grew up in Catholic church, okay? Was an altar boy. Until now, the preach, in the, I mean, the, 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 the priest in the Catholic church is still preaching the same thing. Same thing. Yes. They don't change. To ask Mary to pray for you to God. That's right. When I hear them preach about things like that, I have eating ears. Yes. Because it is very, very sad to see in the time which we were living, which is 21st century, then for people to still believe, keep on believing in lies mm. instead, you know, of, of the truth of God. That's right. So we as a servant of the we have a great job to do. I don't know how we're going to reach out to them because before we used to have crusade in, in the air like that, you know, where you just build up a tent and then invite people to come and listen to the gospel. So because of COVID-19 right now, it is very difficult for us to reach them. So how do we do? I will tell you. I will tell you. It is coming. No, no, it is coming. In fact, the servant of the Lord says that most of God's people are in Catholicism. They are there. They are good people. Believe me. When the angel comes down from heaven with the what? The loud cry. The loud rain. And when the glory of God shall fill the earth with the knowledge of the truth, the truth will come to the mind of the people clearly. They are not able to see it now. So when the voice from heaven shall say, Come out of her, my people, the other sheep in Catholicism, in the Protestant churches, they'll hear the voice of the shepherd and they'll come out in their millions. Their millions. She saw priests. She saw bishops. She saw prelates of Rome accepting the light of truth and come over and join with God's people. It is coming. God is going to see to that. His people are out there. So we don't have to worry. It is coming. And will soon be here. Sister Lois. Yes, I believe um, some of the Catholics people, it will be easier for them to receive this message because they don't know the truth. If you go out and study with them and make them, make them understand the truth, it will be easier for them to catch it. To catch it. If you're going to stir the Catholic, you've got to fast and pray. Fast and pray for several days before you start that Bible study. They're not easy to crack. Believe me. They are not easy to crack. But hard nuts can be cracked by the gospel nut cracker. To the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brother Byron. Yeah, let's back up a little bit, Pastor, where you mentioned, yeah. you asked if, what heaven, when, or was it symbolic when you saw the woman? Yeah, the heaven. We know, we know it is three heaven. Yeah, not the, not the heaven where God dwells. The, atmos the atmospheric heaven? Yeah, atmospheric heaven, yeah. yeah. So, that's... In other words, he was looking. Okay. And it's where it appeared before. Star heaven, maybe? Yeah. Atmospheric heaven. Okay. Not star heaven, but the atmospheric heaven. And was that symbolic? Of course it's symbolic. Amen. Yeah, it's symbolic language. All revelation is symbolic language. Amen. Yeah. So, let's move on. Doctrine of the Incarnation, Protestant teaching of the Incarnation, they expose a similar version of the Immaculate Conception, believe it or not. They what? They exposed a similar virgin of the Immaculate Conception. Now look what Protestantism, look what it teaches. Now look at the Protestant doctrine on the left. So on the left is the Protestant doctrine of the Incarnation. On the left. Their Immaculate Conception, God the Spirit, the Bible doesn't say God the Spirit. Spirit the Spirit of God. But they use God the Spirit. 
God the Spirit impregnates Mary, who is fallen and sinful. Now we're talking about Protestants. Fallen and sinful. But gave birth to a child that is born immaculate and free from what is called original sin. So in the Protestant version of the Immaculate Conception, Mary is sinful. But Mary gave birth to a child that is what? Immaculate. Jesus did not take on sinful nature, but takes the nature of Adam before the fall. On the right side, we look at the biblical model or the biblical doctrine on the right side, or the biblical version of the incarnation. Jesus came all the way down. The fallen man. He bridged the gap, the gap between man and God. Amen. So now look at the difference between the two. To the Catholics, Christ came to Mary. So Mary is a go between humanity and the Son of God. But the Protestant model is Christ came down to Mary, the sinner. But from the sin of Mary, she gave birth to an immaculate Jesus who did not have sinful flesh. Are they the same? Are they speaking the same language? What's the difference? What's the main difference? The, the difference is that, um, that the spirits in the Mary, they, they're including uh, a tripod here, God's spirit and Jesus. What's the main difference between the Catholic virgin and the Protestant virgin, our mother? What's the main difference? Mary. Mary, in the Catholic version or model, Mary is sinless and gave birth to what? A sinless, a savior with a sinful nature. Came to Mary because Mary is immaculate and gave birth to the immaculate son. In the Protestant version or model, Mary is sinful, but she gave birth to a immaculate, immaculate son. See, I must know the differences between the two to understand what they are teaching out there. But Pastor, it is so subtle. Very subtle. It is so subtle that if you're not aware about the Bible's doctrine by studying the Bible, you would quickly think that that doctrine where God sent his spirit to Mary, sent from Mary to create immaculate Jesus, right there and then it will actually isolate Christ to where Christ never wasn't in touch with our infirmities. Right. That's right. Very, very subtle. Now, analysis of both doctrines. Let's analyze them and see what we get. So there is a far gap between God and man. Far gap between God and man in both models. Jesus did not come all the way down to save. Right? He did not come all the way down to save. Both the Catholics and Protestants has accomplished the same. Has accomplished the same. A shouldn't be there. Has accomplished the same. The same what? The same purpose by putting Christ out of the reach of the sinner. How, the, how, how does a Catholic model put Christ out of the reach of the sinner? Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes. Good. What about the Protestant model? How does it put Christ out of the reach of the sinner? That Christ had a sinless body. Sinless human nature. 
So because of that, he had an advantage over us. Yes, because, yes, yes. because a weak mind, yes, a weak mind will actually want to accept something more powerful than us to deal with us and our sinful nature because the problem here is sin. Yeah. But most of us are not understanding that sin started in heaven, right? And, and we are dealing with it here. But Christ, he was involved to understand and be in touch with all of our infirmities, right? While their doctrine is saying that Christ had to be a super being to deal with us, which in turn diverts or the, 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 from the truth of what salvation's plan is all about. Right. He did not touch your man. He did not identify with us. That's what they're saying. Yes, Elder. Is that mic on? We need to turn. The problem of the um, Protestants, you know, versus us seven the Admitters, is that they have no other study to present to their congregation than right. the study of Rome. Right. But we should thank God for for giving, you know, us, you know, like Ellen G. White, whom God reveal certain things right. to teach us so today right. we can have the proper understanding of their doctrine. Right. So therefore, it is imperative that we have the true doctrine of Jesus Christ. Amen. So therefore, Amen. we must send it and try to make it reach the people Amen. that have never reached before. Amen. We have nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing to be ashamed of. The light of truth must go to the world. Oh, huh? we, we are the true Protestants. Right, yes. We are the true Protestants because what? We are protesting against Rome. Exactly. Yes. Those are the churches that call themselves Protestants. They are not true Protestants. No. They are betrayed Luther yes. and Calvin yes. and Wesley, yes. Melanchthon, and all of them because no. Protestantism has, be, has been frozen. It has become static. They are no longer protesting against Rome. They've gone back to Rome through the ecumenical movement. So the only true Protestant church is Seventh-day Adventist. But even the Seventh-day Adventist church is putting down their protests. Yes, because they are being bombarded. So in the Catholic model, Mary has a sinless nature. No bent to sin. In the Protestant model, Jesus has a sinless nature, no bent to sin. So they're really the same. Mm -hmm. Advantage over humanity. Yeah. The teaching that Christ came in sinless flesh makes the doctrine of perfection impossible. The counter to, uh, the country because look, when he was taken up onto the mountain, yeah, he wouldn't even be tempted. Uh, when he, uh, uh, he was tempted, yes, uh, when he was tempted, he said he used the word, he said he used the word of God. So if he did not depend on the word of God, he would have, uh, have become a, a fallen man, amen. Yes. So, amen. You know, so that counteract, the, 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 of course, there. Their, their argument. But they don't see it that yeah. way. Yeah. No. Because the point he mentions, a good point, in the wilderness of temptation, he used the word of God. Why would Satan tempt him if he had a sinless nature? Yes, because he wouldn't need to. Something from outside must appeal to that which is on the inside. Yes. We are tempted because of our weaknesses in the nature. So when we say sinful, we are not saying that he has sin. We are saying that he has a tendency because of the weaknesses of the flesh. He had weaknesses as a result of sin. So Satan appealed to those weaknesses in the flesh. And he had to overcome sin in the flesh. Pastor, the same weak, weakness that we have in our flesh is the same weak 
same way Mary had to. Mary had to. But what had they tried to do, they tried to take Mary and preserve her because of her virginity. Right. By saying that, you know, God had preserved her and to be who, he, who she is. That's why they make people to revere her instead of revering Jesus Christ. I'm happy to mention that. For nature. Yeah. Another lie that they teach, that Mary did not lose her virginity when she had Jesus. She maintained her virginity. Another lie they teach is that Mary did not have other children. They teach that the children were the children of Joseph with his wife before he met Mary. But it's a lie. It's a lie. Joseph had children with Mary. So Mary did not maintain her virginity. In other words, you're saying, when Jesus was born, although he came to the birth passage, and after the birth, then her high man was replaced. It's a lie. That's why I said to you, be careful of Anglo-Saxon theology. Be careful of Anglo-Saxon theology. James was his first brother called Jacob. I wasn't about to ask a question. Not King James. Take for example, Brother Keith. Yeah, my, my if example. If I throw a, a, a wind ball on that wall, what happens? It bounces back. back. It bounces back. Yeah. So what they teach that Christ's nature was like that. Yeah. When Satan hit him with the temptation, because it was sinless, it just bounced back. It couldn't penetrate. But it's not that. No. It is like it, my analogy I'm, I'm thinking of. Yeah. Is for example, I'm a batsman. I like to use the sports and, and I love to hook. So the bowler is going to bounce to me all the time. It's my resistance against it is to not go after it. Because he's going to set the man on fine leg to catch me. Because if I hook, I'm not going to get all of them. I'm going to get, he's going to get out. Mm -hmm. So that was the temptation. Jesus, they know, if they, there, was a, there was some weakness, tendency to sin. He has a tendency to sin. And so Satan was trying to feed him in, his, in that aspect. But he resisted it by not going after the bouncer, not hooking. Yeah. So he said, get behind thee and use the word. Yes, so... so I don't know if I'm making sense. I'm trying you to see, understand. You see, Satan wanted Christ to sin a different way than us. Yeah. If we use our sinful nature to overcome sin, what happened? Fail. We fail. 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 Observe Satan's temptation. He wanted Christ to use what? Divine nature, divine nature to overcome sin. Now, he had used divine nature to overcome sin. Would Why? Us. What would he charge Christ with? He leave us hanging, you know. He would leave uh, us hanging. Yeah. Because we couldn't. We don't have divine nature. We don't have uh, that divine, divine nature. nature. So you know. So, you see the problem? But you so know. he wants us to use our sinful nature to overcome sin, and if we do that, we fail. And he wanted Christ to use divine nature to overcome sin, to satisfy his hunger, turn stones into bread. If he did that, it means that he would have had an advantage over us and he could not be our savior. But what he did, he went to the word. Man shall not live by bread alone. And what is that teaching us? That we should depend on God for our subsistence. Amen. Look at Revelation 3.21. Revelation 3.21. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? Overcome what? Even as I overcame. Now, a man with a sinful nature. Does he have anything to overcome? 
and I'm set down with my father in his throne. Now let's see another text. Let's see another text. The other text says Revelation what? 321. Oh, Revelation, that's what? That's what I just read. The next text is Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of what? Flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that have the power of death, that is the devil. the devil. There's a more powerful text than that we'll use as we go along in Romans. Since we're there, let's see Romans 8, about verse 3, I think. Let's see what is there. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own son in the likeness of what? And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Likeness of? Watch the word likeness is a sort of simile. Other words, he did not have sin in the flesh, but he had what? The likeness of. That means he has a tendency, the weaknesses. And let me say, sin has its results. And what are some results of sin? Death. Death. Did he die? Yes. He died. What other result of sin do we have? Hunger. hunger. Did he suffer hunger? Yes. Is hunger sinful? No. Is it a sin to be hungry? No. 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 It's a result of sin. Yes. Was he thirsty? Yes. yes. It was a result of sin. What other result of sin we have? Biological drive. Yes, he had that too early in the morning because he had testosterone. Is that a sin? No, it's a result of what? Sin. The need. So all those are the result of sin and he had it in his flesh. So what Satan tempted was what? The sinful results in his flesh. The weaknesses. So when he was hungry, hunger is a result of sin. He tempted him to use his divine nature to turn stone into bread. So he did not have the sin in him as such. But he had the what? The tendency. The weaknesses. The results were there. The weaknesses. That's what he tempted. Do we have those weaknesses? Yes. But are they sin? No. Are they sinful? No. But it's when we activate them. Yes. Thought. Thought. I don't like to criticize. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, uh, what, I can take a good critique. Not, not, not about not criticizing. Yes. I'm just saying, I'm thinking, you know, like, for example, as we said, even the Seventh-day Adventist church is bowing to a thing. It's not, it's, it's not a matter of it's a bowing up because you know what? It's the way, is what they are producing. What we are producing. Because like this now, this activate my long-term memory. Things yeah. that I have learned or even I might have been into. I went to a church around three weeks ago and I said to myself, wow, we are in serious trouble. Serious trouble. Because the church is packed. It's a young preacher, young young guy. Mm -hmm. You know, your socks and them things. And you know, I don't mind the dressing and all the dress. But what the message I, I got, the message when the preacher said, My, 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 we are in serious trouble. Because I don't know what, I didn't understand what the man was preaching. And I, I can see that he does not understand even the tenets of. The, the, the doctrine of the church right, and right. they are a minister the, the pastor is a is a is a female pastor no problem with that with me but when we look and I had to take a second look as a man right you know, because I you know I said, 
Right. We are, we are in trouble. So, so I'm saying, know that I'm saying, because these are vintage Adventist doctrine. They're vintage and they're vital. And, you know, and, you know, no wonder you, you see why we're having so much breakaway because even somebody called me from the, uh, uh, who was an elder in my church and his cousin, and they are now gone because they are doing, these are what they are preaching. And so even the church is against them because they are preaching that now. So they are, they are called offshoots and doing, you know. So I'm saying the church is because you go to church, you're not hearing this. And the, 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 the vast majority is like, I thought I was at, what's a guy named, um, not Crefler Dollar. The, the next one there, Joel, Joel Austin. Austin. Smooth. I, I, said, I said, what is this? Cotton I said, can I, the gospel. I wish I, you know, because I was driving so far, I, I slept the night early. I wish I wanted to sleep, because I was sleeping through. Right. You know, <laughs> it doesn't make no sense. Right, right. You know, and it, no, but it sounds joking, but it's serious. If you're, if you're, when you listen to what you're saying here now, false are, are not, are not true or false. And you come here to what those guys are preaching to people. That's why you cannot know some of the when they go anywhere. Cannot. No, I cannot. Yeah. So if sometimes you might be somewhere and, you know, somebody knock you with a, with a, with a, with a question. And you know that person has said the Adventists. But you can't depend on them if they back you up. Right. They don't know it. They can't they don't back know it. it. They don't know it. Man. That's true, Keith. I'm telling you. Now... Some of these guys, they are not burning incense in the St. Adventist Church. You know that? No way. They are burning incense. Where do you get that from? Rome. Rome. What? Burning incense. Rome. Listen, saints. I thought droning was enough. <laughs> Quote, Christ possessed the same nature that man possesses. He was tempted in all points like as man is tempted. The same power by which he obeyed is at man's command. The same what? The same power. Ellen G. White, that I may know him, page 292. Same power available to us. Because he loved his son. He loved us just like how he loved his son. Amen. Amen. So the father did not give Christ anything that he not, he's not willing to give to us. The same power is available to us. I might say praise God. What? <laughs> My brother, I tell you, they know who I am. <laughs> yes, they're leaving. Yes. Yes. Got to teach. Got to teach it. Okay. Let's move on. Were you saying something, brother? Yeah. It's like um, last night, right? Because I was going over some, some, some sermons you have, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm, I'm really hungry, but I remember this is the Sabbath, right? And... I had habits to where I would just go buy some snacks from the store and say, you know, I'm going to repent and ask God to forgive me about it. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> so last night. No, let, let me say this. Stick the pin. If you did not have the money before sunset and you got the money after sunset, you can go and buy sufficient just for the Sabbath. You don't go and fill up a shopping cart. You just buy sufficient to eat for the Sabbath. Amen. That's okay. Oh. Yeah, because then in my head there's this scripture um, or you were saying about um, one of the ways of, um, because right after you did the, fr um, from the Friday night yeah. program, I said, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And it's, I'm like, just go down the street and go buy a burger or whatever. I'm like, hmm. But isn't one of the ways, because when you said it to me about obedience, 
to God is another way of being tested like a crucible and gold. Yes. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to deal with this. <laughs> I'm going to deal with it. Yeah. So I just couldn't take the hunger anymore. I mean, it was just growing and growing and growing. <laughs> so I jumped in my vehicle and started driving. <laughs> <laughs> I went to another job site just to secure the place and just look and if everything is all right. And I said to myself, you know what? God is going to take care of this hunger inside me. So I woke up this morning and I came to church today. And then after church was over, there was no one over there. And I'm like, hmm, I'm still hungry. But <laughs> you know what? God is going to fix this for me. Yes. Because you know what? I need to see myself going through the practice of obeying his will. Yes. So that's my point. So right. Now, I always keep food in my car. Always. If you go to my car and you find food, uh -huh. you know why I do that? Because let me tell you something. If you're driving I-95 and there's a serious accident and you're between two exits, there's no way you can go. And you can sit there for six, eight hours because they're not hurrying. And can you imagine, you stuck for six, eight hours on I-95 and don't have food. Your blood sugar is going to plunge. You got to keep food in the car, man. Some nuts or some chips or something. Organic chips. Then I still. So Christ was tempted, my brothers and sisters, and the power that was available to him is available to us. Amen? Amen. He totally dependent on, the, depended on the Father. Carnal, natural man cannot abolish his enmity against God. It's a part of his nature. It is intertwined in every fiber of his being. But Jesus took upon himself our nature of flesh and blood Hebrews 2 14 in all things to be made like unto his brethren Hebrews 2 17 of the seed of David according to the flesh Romans 1 3 he met and abolished in his flesh the enmity the carnal mind Romans 8 7 the mind of the flesh, Romans 8, 7. He conquered sin in the flesh for us forever. And this quotation is taken from Sabbath School Quarterly, first quarter, 1928, page 15. That's what they believed back then. But they, do they believe that quote today? No. No. They got the spirit thing no. Spirit no. Now look at these passages now. Romans 7, 24 and 25. Romans 7, verses 24 and 25. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. When he used the word law here, he using the word nomos, not entole. He used the word nomos, which means all the will of God. If he used the word entole, it means commandments. So I myself serve the law of God. That means the Torah. But with the flesh, the law of sin. sin. Now, let's see Romans 8, 1 to 4. Romans 8, 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Who walk, who walk not after the flesh, but what? Because now you're serving God with the what? The law of the, the, spirit. the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Pause there. Pause there. Which law is the law of sin and death?
Which law is the law of sin and death? No. The Ten Commandments is not a law of sin. It is holy. Good. It's perfect. So which law is the law of sin and death? The law of sin. Sin is a law. Sin is a principle of law. Yes. The law of sin and death is sin. So sin is a law. A principle in you. The commandments don't really kill you. Unless you transgress it. It is sin that kills you. It is sin that transgresses the law. It's not when you transgress you sin. The sin is committed first in the mind. Covertly. And that leads to activate the transgression of the law. So when you transgress, then you die. But what kills you is the sin. Because the wages of sin is death. And sin was in the world before the law was codified. But it was there in principle. Yes. You understand? Yeah. You mentioned something Friday night. Go ahead. You mentioned something Sunday on um, Friday night that um, in the spirit we should assume ourselves with the bridegroom in heaven in his marriage at this time. Right? Well, I said the marriage is going on now in heaven. We must attend the marriage by faith. Say the wedding Say is going on in heaven. The investigative judgment is the wedding. It is going on in heaven. So we must attend by what? Faith. When Christ comes again, Luke 12, 36, he's coming from the marriage. So we are the bridesmaids. He's coming for us to attend the reception which is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we are guests because heaven is not our home. So when you go to a man's house, you're what? You're a guest. Heaven is his father's house. So it takes us there for the marriage supper of the Lamb as guests, but we'll come back to this earth to our home. You understand? So the wedding is going on now, but we must attend by what? Yes. By faith. And then when the work of the investigative judgment is over, then he will come now to receive us and take us to his father's home. Right. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of what? Sin and death. Not from the Ten Commandments. Christ's death has not freed us from the Ten Commandments. It freed us from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak. Through the flesh. God sent in his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So what is condemned is the sin in the flesh. And that's what Christ died for. He died to condemn sin in the flesh. So the righteousness of the law can be fulfilled in our lives through the Spirit. Let's see the next verse. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So when we look at Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, let's go there. Let's go there. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is what? No law. Because the fruit of the Spirit fulfills the intent of the law. And what is the intent of the law? The intent of the law is to make us love. To give us peace. To give us joy. To make us long-suffering. To make us gentle and all that. But the law itself cannot give that. Why? 
Because we are sinful. We are sinful. So what Christ did, Christ condemned sin in the flesh when he died. He did not remove the law. The law is there. What he died for is the law of sin in the flesh that he condemned in the flesh by overcoming sin in the flesh. So don't worry about the flesh. The flesh is condemned. Christ gained victory over the flesh for us. That's why it justifies us. Our focus now must be on the law of the spirit in the mind. Because when the law of the spirit in the mind is fulfilled, then the intent of the law is accomplished through the fruit of the spirit. So when we live out the fruit of the spirit, then we fulfill the law in our minds, in our hearts. The focus of the church must be on the fruit of the spirit. Because Christ condemned sin in the flesh already. Is your flesh bothering you? Yes. It will still bother you. Yes. Paul said, I serve the law of sin in my flesh. But what happened? What is still about his mind? But he served God with what? The law of the spirit in his mind. So sin's Still bother us in the flesh. But don't worry. Because that is what? Condemned already by Christ. Christ overcame the flesh for us. So our focus of the church must be on the law of the spirit in the mind. To fulfill the fruit of the spirit of Galatians 5. 22 and 23. And then the intent of the law will be fulfilled. So the law could not help us to fulfill those ingredients of the spirit because you're in the flesh. So the law is now placed in our minds through the spirit. And through the spirit, it's the intent of the law is fulfilled. So we must have the spirit in our lives for that to take place. We must have the spirit. Because if we don't have the Spirit of God, we are none of His. We are none of His. So focus on the fruit of the Spirit, saints. That's where the victory lies. Not law. Not law. The fruit of the Spirit. And when the fruit of the Spirit is fulfilled in our lives, then the intent of the law is accomplished. You understand? Brother Booth, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I learned, I'm learning more about the Spirit and realize the Spirit is offered to us or imputed unto us through Christ or from Christ, okay? And some Protestant church would actually want to use the Holy Spirit in their way to show that they are godly, of which in turn is just all a farce. And that's the difference here. You see, once you are in the walk with God, to his liking, he will grant unto you the Holy Spirit, which will produce these fruits. Of course, the fruit of the Spirit. One fruit, but many ingredients. Nine ingredients. Exactly. Right. Versus those who are in uh, certain types of church, not to be judgmental, to call it the name, but they are using the Holy Spirit to shake about, rolling on the floor and jumping no, and all that that's stuff. that's not the Spirit. They are trying to use the Holy Spirit, which yeah. in turn is abusing the, the understanding of of, of what Christ has imputed unto us. The work of the Spirit. That's right. That's right. We're going to close off here with this. Christ took our nature in its deteriorated condition. In its what? 4,000 years of human degeneracy came upon him. Manuscript 143, 1897. By taking man's nature in its fallen condition, he was subject to the infirmities and weaknesses of the flesh with which humanity is encompassed. Ellen G. White, Manuscript, 143, 1897. There should not be the faintest misgivings in regard to the perfect 
freedom from sinfulness in the nature of Christ. Ellen White, manuscript 1 Father 3, 1897. There should not be the faintest misgivings in regard to the perfect freedom from sinfulness. Now that's different from sinful. What is sinfulness? We have the suffix next there. Suffix, ness. Sinfulness is different from sinful. Sinful doesn't mean that you're full with sin. It means that you have the tendency because of the weaknesses or the result of sin in you. But we'll talk about sinfulness. You're saying that you're guilty of what? Committing sin. Christ did not commit, in, commit sin. He was free from sin. But he had what? The sinful nature or the tendency of weaknesses. So he overcame those in his flesh. He had a sinful nature. But it was free from sinfulness. His sinful nature was not activated by choice. Then it would become full of sin. Which would result in sinfulness. He did not activate his sinful weaknesses of the flesh by choice. Do you understand? By choice. So it's by choice. We now who are free. So it's by, by choice now who we are who, who have come to Christ in repentance and baptism now. It's a choice it's now choice. that we become sinful in our weakness of sin. So, in other words, we choose to do that, right. then become sinful. Sin. You see, sin is not a substance in you, as I said before. No. Sin a, is a choice. a choice. So when you make the choice to sin, you become a sinner. It's a choice. Christ did not choose to sin. So he was sinless. We, have, we make the choice, we made choices to sin. In our lives. So we are sinners. He was not a sinner. He was a divine, pure son of God who did not choose to sin. So he was sinless with a sinful human nature. And Ellen G. White said, we have the same power available to us as was available to Christ. Amen? Amen. So he had no advantage over us. So then, for the young Christian then, the answer is that we have to make the choice. But we cannot just say we're going to have the choice by ourselves. We need someone who is the author of the better choice, which That's is right. Christ. Christ. So we look at him, and we have the perfect example. Amen. But through him, we, can, we are overcomers yeah. by yes. choosing to say, Christ's way or no way. Right. Remember now, God cannot forgive the sinful nature. It must be what? Destroyed. What he forgives is the what? The fruits of the nature. The acts of sin. That's what we confess. No matter how you confess the sinful nature, it cannot be forgiven. It must be destroyed. And that's what Christ did. He destroyed it on the cross of Calvary. That's why we can be justified. So the sanctifying process now is through the what? The fruit of the, the Spirit. We become like the Lord Jesus Christ. The intent of the law is fulfilled through the fruit of the Spirit. But the nature, he cannot forgive it. Therefore, Christ condemned it. And then when we choose Christ, we are justified. We are declared to be righteous. And who he justifies, he sanctifies. And that comes through the Spirit, the recreative power of God. Not a separate God. The Holy Spirit is the other self of Christ. We call it the alter ego. Not a separate God. 
Any question or statement on the conference line before we close? Any question or statement from the conference line? We'll pick up the study again next Sabbath evening, God's willing, yes. part two. Yes, there's somebody there. Yeah, I'm trying to understand this part. I, I understand it, but it's like, so if we are connected to Christ, most of us in what we choose to do probably when we were younger and didn't, probably couldn't reason out things. Time of and ignorance, God winked at. The time of ignorance God winked at. You confess those sins when you came to Christ, they are forgiven. Christ died for yes, sins of the past, the present, and the future. But that has to do with your sinful nature. Right, yes. Yeah. So, most of the time we choose to sin because we didn't connect, have that connection with Jesus. Because yes. Jesus had that connection with his Father. So he didn't sin. He didn't choose so, to sin. He could have sinned. He didn't choose to, to sin. But he didn't, he, choose, he to didn't sin. choose to sin. But talking to the normal person or the lay person out there, they don't look at it like that because they feel that Christ couldn't sin. That's you what know? they are taught. That's what they are yes, taught. Yes. But he could have sinned, but he did not choose to sin. Sin is a choice. Transgression is a choice because of sin. He didn't transgress yeah, the law because he didn't way choose way. to sin. Yeah. So you understand that? So I, yes, yes. So I don't worry about your past I sins. But probably back then I didn't understand that you just think, so, you know, you were yes. just living in... So don't past, worry about the past, that my too. sister. That is gone. Don't let the past bother you. Now it's gone. That's washed away. God has justified you. He declared you to be righteous. Then enjoy the freedom he gives you in the spirit. And let him work out the fruit of the spirit in your life. Forget the past. Don't let Satan bring up the past in your mind. God has forgiven. Okay, right, good. Any other thoughts or question? question? Yes, my elder. The last comment that I want to make is that Jesus Christ chose not to sin. He overcame over, over for us. Yes. All this thing that we have we have made before, as you just said to Sister right. Body, that you know the past sins are forgiven. Yes. But since we are still living in this world of sin, we are facing to temptation every day in our lives. Right. So um, it is um, for us to ask God to send His Holy Spirit to help yes. us um, um, discerning you right. know, when when we are facing a situation like that, right. because we are not like Jesus. We have to. Ask him, ask God to send his Holy Spirit to help us to become like Jesus. But we are like never, Jesus. We, are, we, ne we will never be like Jesus. Yes, we are like Jesus. We can be like. But what I'm trying to <laughs> yeah. understand now is that the devil himself, he did not use only one way of tempting Jesus. He tried many, many sins. But we, as a Christian, we have a tendency of taking the, um, like, Having, having sex with somebody that is a sin. There are so many ways the devil tempted Jesus, but Jesus rebuked him at all of them. Yeah. So therefore, we must strive, you know, pray and ask God to send us his Holy Spirit to help us discern where, yeah. whatever the sin that we are facing, whatever the temptation, I should say, we are facing, right. so God can help us to overcome it in the name of Jesus. Yeah, in fact, there are four temptations, but they remove the temptation with the woman. They remove the temptation with the woman. They take it out. The four temptations of Christ, but the one with the woman is removed. You don't have time for that. 
So, so Pastor, uh, may I comment? Yeah. May I support Brother Louie on this one? Yeah, go ahead, my brother. Okay. Being a young Christian, the devil is going to bombard you yeah. with everything that you have done wrong. He'll dredge it up and it makes you war with yourself. It makes you like, Lord, being a Christian is too hard for me to keep. But, you see, not knowing that if we believe on Christ, that's the difference. So if you're not knowing that, and actually it's important that we meditate on the word, right? And we have to ask the Holy Spirit of God to lead us to, to the scripture that we can meditate on because it will help us. Because if the devil knows in your mind that you do not know the scripture to use it to guard your heart and mind, so what you do know is that when these things come, okay, simply remember that you gave it to Christ and he has that burden taken care of for you. All you have to do is resist him because the more you resist him, okay, he will have to flee because Christ will have his angels charged over you. Amen. One thing I want to bear in mind was a woman that caused the fall of the first Adam. And Satan wanted a woman to cause the fall of the second Adam. Four temptations. The last one was a woman. But he could not get Christ to sin. Yeah. Sometimes we tend to do it by self. You know, we want to depend on ourselves to overcome these things. Yes. But the total dependency like Christ is, is on like Christ. Father, yeah. So we cannot do it on our own. Right. We're going to ask Christ through the Holy yes. Spirit to do it. Yes. Amen. Praise, Praise the Lord. We have to have Jesus' character. Yes. Because the character comes yes. from Yes. Yes. Because I can take example on myself as. Back in 1983, when I became a Southern Adventist, you know, then I behaved myself in a certain way for me not to fall in sin. Yes. Because you have to have character for that. Yes, yes, yes. What I mean by that, by helping a sister in the church, yeah. doesn't mean that because I help her, then I have to, to, to go after her yeah. vulnerability and yeah. to, to fall in sin with her. Right. You have to behave yourself in a certain way. Amen, amen. If you don't do that, then you sin. You know, voluntarily, right. it is very difficult for God to perform the decision for you. Right. Because you have to be here so So, remember the text says, let this mind be in you. That was in Christ. Not let this flesh. He overcame the flesh for us. That's forgiven. But let this mind be in you. It is the mind. The mind and the law of the spirit that we must deal with. The mind. Number 176, to close. I gave my life for thee. Let us stand. I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed. That thou might run some be. And quicken from the dead I gave, I gave my life for thee What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee What hast thou given for me? My Father's house of light, my glory circle throne, I left for earthly night, for wandering sad and long. I left, I left it all. For thee, <clears throat> what hast thou left out for me? I left, I left.
lift it up for thee. What hast thou wrought for thee? I suffered much for thee. I suffered much for thee. can tell a bitterest agony to rest kill thee from hell. I bore, I bore it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? I bore, I bore it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? Praise the Lord. He bore it all for us. Let us bow our heads of prayer. Let's take a volunteer from the conference line. Ask God to be with us for the coming week and give him thanks for the blessings that we receive today and give thanks for the offering. Who would be the volunteer to close in prayer? O oh, gracious Almighty Father, our Father in heaven, we thy children come humbly bowing before you, giving you thanks and praise for the many blessings that you have blessed us with through this blessed and holy Sabbath day, from Sabbath school to divine service till now. We are so thankful, Lord, for the fellowship, the rest, the rest that you have given us, the rest in you. And help us, Lord, to continue to look forward to the next Sabbath when we will rest again, worship and fellowship with you and learn more about you and your soon coming. Lord, we pray that you will continue to prepare us for your kingdom because as we look around, Lord, and we see all that is happening around us, help us to focus our mind on you, to keep our hearts set on you, and to have that mindset, to keep the mind that was in you, Lord. Help us, Lord, that we will have that assurance. Only as we commit ourselves and connect with you, Father God, that we will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We continue to pray for each and every one who are at the meeting all and those who are on the conference line. We pray for blessing upon each and every one for the week. And may we continue to love you, to love each other, and to show forth your praise. Be with the offering that was collected tonight, Lord. We pray that it will go to finish your work, and men and women will be commit themselves to you, and your name will be glorified. Thank you again for your many blessings. Go with each and every one, and may we continue to study your word as I ask these blessings and the full forgiveness of all our sins for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Bode, for your prayer. Thanks, everyone, for coming out this evening. And thanks, everyone, for viewing and all those who are connected. Have a good week. Remember, tomorrow night for our Bible study right out here. Come out in your numbers and bring someone with you to hear the word of the Lord. Have a good week. God bless you all. Amen. Tuesday night, prayer line. Wednesday night, prayer meeting. And Friday night, review of Sabbath school lesson. Safe ride home. The Lord bless you all. <laughs> it's 7.30. 8.30.